Hello, I'm Steve Maskery and welcome to Workshop Essentials. It's actually very difficult to film a glue up because I haven't got time to fanny about with cameras at the same time as I'm fannying about with bottles of glue. So you'll have to make do with a few photographs. But there are a few things to talk about. The first thing is I don't want to have to do any more clean up than is absolutely necessary. I certainly don't want to get glue dribbling all over my veneer and blo blocking the pores because that will spoil the finish. So I've given the uh, surface of the veneer a coat of hard wax oil before I've done the glue up. In fact, I did it before I even cut the boards up. I did the whole sheet with a coat of hard wax oil. And that seals the pores. And so if I do get any glue on there, then it will be easier to clean up. The second thing is the strips are very thin. So when I come to clamp them, if I just put the clamp directly on the strip, I will get pressure points where the clamps are and then there'll be no pressure in between them. So I'm using a pressure bar like this to spread the pressure. It's not to protect the edges. These are soft clamps. They're not going to, they're going to, not going to mark the job, but they spread the pressure. So even on this, which is about nearly a metre long, I can get away with just five clamps. And I really want glue squeeze out on both faces. So that helps if I put three on one side and two on the other, roughly half and half. I do want glue squeeze out on both sides, but that's not always easy to achieve, especially if you can't see the other side. Now for the small ones, I can lift it up and turn it over. But for the big ones that might have a dozen clamps on it, there's no chance that I'm gonna be able to flip that, on, uh, that one over on my own. So if you can only see one face, make sure that it's the good face that you can see and make sure you've got a good glue squeeze out on that and hope for the best on the other side. As it's turned out, all my primary faces have come out beautifully clean. Perfect, no gaps or anything. And most of the secondary faces have as well. But on a couple of the boards, one of the short ones and this double, I've got a bit of a gap on the back. Uh, it's not awful, but I want it right I don't want it nearly right, even though they're not seen. I want it right for my own peace of mind. All is not lost. If after about half an hour in the clamps, you can check, you take the clamps off, the glue's gone off, it won't be fully cured, and if you've got any gaps, just work some glue into the gaps. And then clean off with a wet cloth, get rid of all the glue, and then re-clamp. And as you can see, I've put all the clamps on the same face this time, and that's to apply pressure on this edge. And I get just the merest hint of glue squeeze out, which is exactly what I want. And this has been set up all night, so this is fully cured now. And I can take the clamps off. When the clamps are off, I'm left with this little lip all the way along, which needs to be trimmed off. Now, I could use a block plane, and that's quiet, and it's very satisfying to do. But if the grain changes direction, I'm going to get tear out and there's always the risk of nicking the veneer when I get close. So I prefer to use a trimming jig like this. Now, these little routers are brilliant. They are small and lightweight and comfortable to hold. They're plenty powerful enough for a job like this and they're inexpensive. I've actually got three now. And it means that I can set one up for a job like this and then leave it set for the whole of the project. The jig itself is two parts. There's a, a base to which the router is screwed and then there's a, another base that's screwed to that and that's covered in plastic laminate or you could use slick plate just so that it slides nicely on the surface with no friction. Dead easy. <laughs> well, it should be. This took me all morning yesterday to make and uh, I had to have a couple of goes. This was the first base plate that I made and it might look the same but in fact the holes are in a different position and the position of the holes determines the ergonomics of the router. I had it mounted on this in such a way that the cable was coming out over my hand. I was holding it like this and the switch is right way around here really awkward to use. 
So I can't just turn it through 90 degrees because the holes are asymmetric. So I've had to make another base. To get the hole positions, I take the base plate off the router and work out how I want it to be. So I want this, when the router jig is in that position, I want the cable coming out towards me so that my hand is clear. I'm holding it like this and the on-off switch is in a convenient position for my fingers up here. So I can tell from this how the, where the holes need to be, but I need to mark them on the underside because we're counter-boring. So put this on how I want it, reposition it underneath, and turn the whole thing over. And then I can mark through for the various holes. When you're counter-boring, it's important to drill the counter-bore bit before you drill straight through. Otherwise, you lose the position for the uh, centre of your drill. So I've, I've actually had to re-tap the base on this. The screws that came with it weren't metric, and all the screws over here are metric these days. So uh, I've simply re-tapped it to M4, and then there are some round head screws that screw it in place. Now to set it up, you take the body of the router out and get a piece of paper folded into three. And that goes underneath there, not underneath there. So that goes underneath where the cutter's going to be on a flat surface. And in fact, I usually do this on my table saw or bandsaw table. Then the body of the router goes in like that. Down to the paper and gets locked off. And that means that the end of the cutter is just a tiny bit above the surface of the veneer. And I need to check before I use it, move the whole thing sideways over the veneer, like that, a little bit, on a secondary face, on a secondary face, and have a look. And you should see no scratches. If you see a little scratch, it means it's too low and you need to reset it again. So this is going to trim my lip like this. Um, normally, when you're machining an edge, I would work in this direction. The cutter's going round like this, and you would move in this direction. But in this case, I'm actually going to do most of it coming back. I'm not cutting the edge, I'm cutting the top. And I'm only removing a very tiny amount of material anyway. So by pulling it back this way, the cutter is pushing the fibres into the board, not trying to rip them off. So, let's have a go. That's really nice, actually. And it just now needs a bit of a quick sand with some P1, uh, this is 240, I think. Ah, oh, that is really good. That is really good. Excellent. This uh, edge is still uh, a sawn edge off the table saw, so I've got to give it a couple of swipes with a plane. Then I bevel the edge with eight swipes of my block plane on the show face and just a couple to ease the aris on the secondary face. I say eight, it doesn't have to be eight, it's just that I want them all to be the same and that's about right for the way my block plane is set up. And of course I could just as well use a chamfer bit in a router. I still have some tall cabinet sides to finish, but next time we meet, I'll be making the plinth. So until then, thank you for watching and enjoy your workshop. Cheerio.